Well, that's the kind of thing that we'd like to have, have happen. We also participate in a lot of forums that are defining uh, legislation around this area. Um, again, from an Australian perspective, you have to imagine me as a, as a very pretty blonde woman with an Australian accent, um, which I'm not. Um, so it's one of only five countries in the region um, that have specific child pornography legislation. And Julie is actually very active in trying to get that expanded. She's taken this as a personal mission. That's why she's a, a very good person to, to contact. If you want to understand how this can be accomplished in your country, Julie has uh, just a wealth of wonderful ideas. And I'll, I'll end quickly so that we can get back a little bit on schedule here. We feel that you know, adults absolutely have to be proactive in this, in this issue. You can't, just, you can't just let it to the children to figure it out themselves. That will not work and that open communication is absolutely critical to this. And clear rules about how they should use the internet are equally part of that. And we need to involve the parents as well as the teachers and the caregivers. It, it has to be an all-inclusive effort. And it has to be very well disseminated. And it has to come from a variety of different sources that children themselves trust and, and understand. And it's an urgent problem. And so this is really the, the call to action. I think it's sort of preaching to the choir here. I think all of you require how, understand how important this is. But we urge you to work in whatever way you can. And please contact us if there's anything we can do to help. Um, we, we take this problem extremely seriously. And then I'll leave this up for between now and the, and the next speaker, so you can copy some of these down. Obviously, these are uh, the Australian uh, slant on this, the, the .au there. But uh, they, they're all trace back to the, uh, the Microsoft site. And we're doing this mostly. It, it's an international effort. It just happened to be uh, Julie's doing this uh, from the Australian perspective. So is this uh, the right time to take some questions? So if there are a few questions, I'd be glad to, to take them. Yeah. We can. Uh we can move. Oh, you want to go to the next speaker yeah, instead? And we'll yeah, take and all the, the questions. Because we may have a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have this kind of interaction. So the next, uh, the next speaker will be John Carr, which uh, is, uh, is the, who is the secretary of the UK Children's Charities Coalition on Internet Safety. And I had the pleasure to work with him I mean, uh, this, this summer, so I too is. Uh, is also working with UK and with, with on, uh, on on these issues. Okay, uh, good morning. I, I know we're very pressed for time, so I will uh, give you a super condensed version of my presentation because I could see the hands shot up. Uh, questions from Microsoft, and it's very understandable why people want to speak to Microsoft, and, uh, and no doubt there'll be other questions for the speakers. I mean, the heading, uh, the heading, the title for the workshop is uh, "Risks to Children in Using the, the the Internet." I'm going to abandon a large, to a large degree, the the PowerPoint. I'll come back to it in a minute for reasons which I'll explain. But uh, historically, when we uh, used to speak about uh, risks to children on the, in the online space, we we used three uh, specific headings to describe the risks, and conveniently, they all began with the letter C. That was contact, uh, commerce. Uh, and content. Um, content is obviously the uh, kind of pornographic images, including illegal child pornographic images, images of violent material, things of that kind to which children uh, could be exposed uh, relatively easily um, um, if they went online. Commerce was to do with uh, the way that children not being so worldly wise as, as uh, most adults are being conned essentially by companies through hard sell, hard selling over the internet or through simple deceit into buying goods or services or giving information about their parents income or family consumption patterns uh, and so on in a way that was com completely unscrupulous and contact of course is the more familiar one to many people of uh, sexual predators using the uh, interactive capabilities of the internet to make content, uh, contact with children for illegal sexual purposes, typically. Uh, but into that category also, more recently, of course, we know, now know that the single most important 
uh, aspect of contact type risks to children in the online space is bullying. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the volume of complaints or the volume of issues that come in uh, to the different child protection agencies in relation to the online space, bullying, harassment of one kind or another is easily the single most important uh, issue. More recently, <coughs> to the to the list of three that lasted for many years when we were talking about these issues, we need to add a further two. Uh, one is the question of addiction, certainly in <coughs> and. This varies from country to country again, as all of these things do, but certainly in some parts of the world, the question of children spending excessive amounts of time typically playing online games, uh, but doing other things at the expense of normal kind of social interaction at the expense of uh, playing games and doing all of the other things that are good for children to do as they grow up. Uh, addiction is certainly a factor uh, that uh, is of concern to, to, to policy makers. And uh, finally, of course, is the issue of privacy, which has become come onto the agenda more recently. And the, the, the privacy issue intersects in, in some way or another with almost all of the ones that I just mentioned, uh, all of the above sort of thing. And uh, in, in solving and addressing issues of children's privacy online, we are in fact also addressing uh, to some degree or another issues around contact, issues around content, issues around commerce too. Uh, it's, it's come into sharp relief recently through, as we were hearing earlier, questions around how children are using social networking sites and how they're disclosing what many of us would consider to be uh, excessive uh, amounts of personal information which can do them harm. They may not realise it now, uh, we do as adults because we've, we've seen the way in which personal information can be misused, uh, but it, it is um, nonetheless a very, very important um, aspects of child protection in the in the online space. Just before I go into the the, sort of the few remarks I will now make about um, child pornography on the internet, um, I just want to respond to one of the points that, uh, that's, that's been made this morning. Um, people speak about children, people speak about parents and families as if there is some kind of typical child, some typical parent and some typical family. So when, when people speak about the importance of uh, education uh, for children, parents and families, and who could be against education, everybody of course is in favour of promoting uh, education and awareness as the best possible means of protecting a child uh, when they go on the internet, of course that's true. But when, uh, um, when, when people speak about this issue, it's as if there is only one type of child, there is only one type of parent, and there is only one type of family. And that these, all of these families and all of these children and all of these parents have got equal capability, equal intellectual grasp of the issues, equal kind of familial resources to, to deal with them. This is simply not the way the world is. There is a huge variation uh, between children and their, their ability to understand, receive educational messages. There is a huge variation between families and their capability of, uh, of dealing with some of these issues. You know, you, when you hear people speaking about education as if it were the panacea, uh, they don't, perhaps, I don't know what planet they're living on, but, you know, not every family lives in a house with three bedrooms and a computer in a little, in a living room, and they all sit down for dinner every evening and have a, a very nice chat about what's been going on that day at school and how can I help you with this, that, and this. That's not the way the, the planet works anymore. I mean, if it ever did. And so to model, model, to model your safety strategy solely or even largely on reaching out to this mythical child and this mythical family and these mythical, highly engaged parents seems to me to be no strategy at all seems to me to be more of a cop-out because you've constructed something that actually doesn't exist. So I, I mention that particularly because, I mean, the internet of all things is a technical construction. We use technical measures. I mean, Microsoft, uh, not that long ago, uh, willy-nilly, decided that they would turn on the firewall by default in, 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 in Windows and, uh, and Invista, and I'm very glad they did. Why did they do that? Because they decided that the educational message about the importance of using firewalls was simply not working well enough 
for the security of the network as a whole. Well, I, I, I make this point simply to say that whilst, of course, education and awareness are crucial, so too is the technical aspects of how we will protect children and families. So when, and, and we must never uh, lose sight of that. We must equally never rely solely on technical measures. I absolutely agree with that, but I certainly do see a very large role for technical measures in, in helping keep children safe online. I'm going to skip through all of this stuff uh, very rapidly indeed. Um, we're talking here under the umbrella of the ITU, a very important global organization that can reach into parts of the world and to governments and policy makers uh, across all five continents in, in, in a way that many other organizations can't. And there is a huge job to be done on a, on a global level, and that's why I was particularly pleased to hear the COP initiative being announced in November, and I certainly look forward to working uh, with the ITU uh, as best as I can in helping to take that issue forward. Um, the American International Center for Missing and Exploited uh, Children did an excellent piece of work, indeed everything that they do is excellent, uh, an excellent piece of work where they studied the kind of legal framework which existed in relation to child abuse images around the world. And what they discovered, for example, is that there are still over 80 countries in the world where there is no specific law no specific mention of child pornography within that country's legal framework. Now, some countries, it has to be said, use their general obscenity laws to deal with issues of child sex abuse images uh, on the internet, but it seems to us, uh, has done for some time, that unless the legal framework contains a specific reference to child pornography, it, you will tend to find that the police services and the law enforcement agencies generally will, won't give it the sort of high priority which we think uh, it deserves. There are still, uh, Dieter mentioned uh, in his uh, remarks, there are still uh, some countries where it is technically impossible to commit a crime on the internet. They don't have the equivalent of a computer misuse act. They don't recognize the legal existence of cyberspace and a story which I'm sure some of you will have heard before uh, of um, two children, they were playing online games, two young people playing online games in, a, in this country and uh, one of the guys was really good at the game and he, he'd got lots and lots of extra weapons that he could use in the game to help him win and become master of the universe in this game. Anyway, another guy who he was playing against hacked into his account and stole one of the big weapons from this guy's account and he then used it to help him win the game and become master of the universe. Um, well, this, the other guy found out who it was who'd hacked into his account, and he lived not very far away from him, as it turned out, and he went round and he killed him, he murdered him, stabbed him to death with a knife. Uh, well, obviously, when the police did their investigation, it was very easy uh, to charge the guy with murder because there was a dead body on the, f on the carpet, on the floor in the house, but what they couldn't do was charge him with theft because un in their legal system, it was impossible to steal an intangible object. It was impossible to steal something that only existed in cyberspace or only, only existed in the virtual world. So of course, and there are still, as I say, 20 countries, over 20 countries in the world where that is, uh, that is still the case. Now clearly, um, any criminals or any, any organized groups who want to put child pornography somewhere safe are going to go to countries that either have no laws on this matter or have no laws at all to do with cyberspace. And that's also um, something which the ITU could be very um, actively engaged in promoting. Still only 31 countries in, in the world with hotlines. There isn't a hotline at all in the Arabic language, for example. Um, and so that's also a great deficiency that we need to uh, we, need, we need to remedy. Hotlines are the key, one of the key ways that the public can be engaged in, uh, in helping deal with the question of child abuse images on the internet. There are still only, I mean Interpol would never acknowledge this publicly, but certainly if you speak to officers in Interpol privately, they will tell you that in their opinion there are only around about 30 police forces nationally around the world who've got the technical capability to take part. Um, uh, the trained officers, the equipment and so on to, to, to enable them to take part in, um, in international police actions on cyber crimes of any kind. Virtual Global Task Force, a very important development, the first time that Interpol and uh, national police forces have come together specifically tasked on protecting children on the online space. 
dealing with child pornography, dealing with sexual predators. Uh, after four years of existence, it still only has five countries in membership, UK, Australia, Canada, um, and Australia, um, and, and, and Italy, sorry. The, the Japanese, the Germans, and, and various others are queuing up to join, but still after three years, only five forces are in there, and that seems to me something that we need to improve upon because it's a great experiment and a great uh, opportunity. Um, you've heard uh, earlier about blocking. We think this is incredibly important. A lot of the guys in the business of, uh, of, of peddling child sex abuse images on the internet are only doing it for the money. Uh, and so if you can stop them reaching their customers, if you can stop those images being presented to people who buy them, the guys who are doing it and who are systematically arranging for children to be sexually abused so that they can take new images that, so that they can then sell seems to me to be very, uh, very important. Uh, when we, at the beginning of 90, uh, 1996, when we first started making records of these things in the United Kingdom, 18% of all of the child pornography images that were being found in Britain were being published out of Britain. Today, it's less than 0.2%. Partly this has been achieved, I wouldn't say entirely, but partly this has been achieved through the deployment of blocking of all known child pornographic, uh, commercial child pornographic websites irrespective of the jurisdiction where the, they are, these images are being hosted, we are blocking access to them. And by the way, there is an appeal mechanism. If anybody thinks their website's been in, incorrectly classified as an illegal one, there is a mechanism within the IWF, which is the name of our hotline, sorry, for, for getting your website's categorization changed. It has never been used, by the way, um, since 1996. Um, Still very substantive differences in the law and in the field of sentencing, important differences in police procedures, which can also hamper transnational investigations into cybercrime. Again, these things uh, need to be uh, harmonized as best we can. Bulk of the images are still coming out of the USA, and that, by the way, is despite the fantastic work that the American law, enforce, law, law enforcement does and the huge amount of work. I mean, if you looked simply in terms of dollars or pounds or whatever spent <coughs> on att attacking uh, child protection issues, there's no doubt the Americans would be number one. Uh, of course, they have the largest internet infrastructure and they've got the largest number of web, uh, web servers and hosting arrangements and so on, so that's not surprising but nonetheless, there's still the bulk of the images come out of the USA. Uh, the banks have done a lot of good work, but they need to do more. I'm, gonna, I'm getting a hand-waving signal here from the left, so I'll stop here, so at least we'll have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. I'm sorry to stop you. <laughs> But, uh, well, we, we have been working together a little bit, so, and we will carry on, so I know what is the value that you, you, you can bring to the discussion. So now we have really, I mean, a few minutes, I mean, fortunately, we, we start a little bit late, so maybe between five and ten minutes, so if we have questions or, you know, any comment or any, you know, clarification to be addressed to the panel, I mean, yeah. If you can also introduce yourself so we know. Thank you. Steve Del Bianco with Net Choice Coalition. We do a lot of work in the U.S. at trying to um, address something that only came up on the last slide. That is the pursuit and control of child predators. That is to say, known perpetrators post-sentencing, post-serving their term, and then they're released on parole or otherwise. And I'd like to hear from the panelists because uh, I know companies like Microsoft have worked on this in the U.S. and encouraging states and judges to impose post-release con Con, uh, conditions that would monitor the online activity of a convicted child predator. And uh, I, I would close by adding that we're pretty vigilant in making sure that child predators don't live near our children's playgrounds around our schools. Some nations and states have actual uh, limits as to how many kilometers they have to be away from a playground. Why don't we do some of the same restrictions on convicted <coughs> predators with respect to our online playgrounds as well? Well, I mean, as a personal opinion, I think you're very right. We, we, sh we, should, we should also try to see how we could go in this direction, I mean, according again to the, to the local requirements of the council, though. I mean, 
this is uh, also something that has to be addressed in terms of understanding and you know adapting this kind of solutions I mean according to the specific element yeah, yeah. Um, I should make clear I, I act as an advisor to, uh, to to myspace so we'll just get that out of the way uh, myspace has of course done something very like this but only in the USA it's taken the list of convicted sex offenders um, that exist in the USA as a public document. In the UK, you, you couldn't do that, at least not at the moment, because the, the record of convicted sex offenders is not a public document. But in the USA, uh, MySpace has deployed, and other companies as well, by the way, not just MySpace, have taken the, the list of convicted sex offenders and barred them from membership of the, of the website. And it's done for exactly the reasons that you just mentioned. They're trying to keep convicted sex offenders away from places where children and young people go on the internet. I think it's, uh, personally, I think it's a very good idea. I think it's an idea that will grow. The only risk with it is that not all sex offenders are the same, and it can be rather a blunt instrument uh, in that respect. And one of the guys uh, who I have a great deal of respect for within the United Kingdom thinks that there are risks in doing this, because if you push and marginalize some of these people, some of them, no question, absolutely, should never be allowed there. But some of the guys who end up on the sex offenses register actually the more you push them away from mainstream society and keep them away from things, the more likely they are to end up reoffending. So it's not a, it's not a kind of clear-cut thing. But I think, on balance, it's a good idea, and I think it will grow. Yes, Adam. <coughs> Thank you very much. My name is uh, Adam Mambi. I'm the lawyer from the Tanzania Communication Regulatory Authority. Um, I have my my question to the. Um, speakers maybe to the floor also. I, for those who were there yesterday, the, one of the uh, debatable issues was the definition of child pornography. Now, just take an example. I've been out uh, in my, from my country for a couple of years and my wife, she's there, she's washing um, our kid, our child, and while the child is naked, she takes the photo of, of, of our child and now she decided to send um, the photo electronically to me. Now the question is, does that amount to child pornography? Can the police officers uh, arrest my wife for that, um, for sending the, the uh, child, our child while he is naked? So that's, that's my, my question. Thank you. Someone wants to, yeah. Well, normally it would have to be a judge who defines whether it's illegal. Um, you can be charged for alleged criminal uh, activities, but in this context that you are, in this example you mention, all things equal, law enforcement will look at the image and put it in context. So if the context is that you are washing your child, the child is naked of course, then, then that's a family and acceptable situation. Um, so for that reason, question or simple answer is no, it's not illegal. And hence, yes. That? Well, it has to be a sexualized image, yeah. yeah. And uh, the other thing there is, uh, as you said, mens rea, that is uh, criminal intent. Mm. If the image has been yeah. taken uh, specifically for the purpose of uh, sexual enjoyment, mm. that's different. Yeah. And this is a cute kid, and it's sent to the kid's parent, or the kid's friends, relatives maybe. Doesn't really make a difference here. Doesn't really matter. That is. Uh, the question might even be: Okay, fair enough. You have a doctor, a medical. Uh, Those two. I mean. I send one picture to the other with focus on a genital and so forth. That would be quite more a difficult image to uh, justify. And in that sense, I think law enforcement, if they intercepted that image, they would definitely classify it as illegal. But you would need to justify how you actually get about from one doctor to the other. That's a bit more tricky, and I wouldn't know the answer to that. I think that would need to, you know, stand trials actually to see how that would be. No, exactly. If you can't, if you just have the, the vagina of a girl, for instance, that would not constitute an offence because you couldn't classify the, the the person. You couldn't identify the face. So, okay. It would not. okay. Uh, Wait, yeah, your hand um, just. I think quickly. the question uh, it once again shows that um, not to scare everybody off the internet because it is in in itself a neutral, positive thing, I, I guess. But it's just also awareness because putting the, the picture of your child online in public might mean that somebody else might do something 
with it that you do, do not like. So it's also, I, I, I won't say that your wife will be prosecuted by, uh, by law enforcement, I hope not, because probably it's just a nice picture of your child with her, et cetera, et cetera. But in, at the same time, somebody else might do something with that picture if it is public online uh, that is not what it was intended for. So be aware of what you do online. Okay, thank you. Janice from... Yeah. Um, yes, it's not directly rated to, uh, linked to child pornography, however it's pornography online. The U a lot of teachers in the UK have just underlined that when children go to sites which are specifically for children, if they make a spelling mistake, very often they will land on a, a pornographic site, in fact, a sort of an aggregation of pornographic material. And it seems that a lot of the, the people who disseminate this material have bought up all of the domain names which are similar to the children's most popular sites. It seems to me that here is the place to address this. Does anyone have any ideas of what can be done about this problem, which has apparently become quite serious, if I can believe the emails of UK school teachers? Okay. Thank you. I don't know if someone wants to answer, but there was another question or another comment. Yeah? John is saying it's an issue for ICANN. <laughs> Yeah. So and it continues to need, they need to be pressured. No, wait, wait, wait. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Can you hear me? Okay, um Um, uh, I'm from Fiji and I represent uh, ISOC as one of the ambassadors as well as uh, the Pacific countries. Um, as you probably know or may not know, people in the Pacific are still, uh, do not, still do not have access to um, ICTs and internet. And um, uh, most youth in the Pacific are still illiterate and they, do not, um, they, have, they don't have the ability to read and write. And uh, I just want to know what is... Um, ITU's, um, um, how, do, how can ITU provide assistance to these rural and remote areas and how can you like bring awareness to them? Because we, we usually work with the um, urban centers but not uh, focusing on the rural centers who do not have access to information. So, um, and I also see that uh, there's a kids helpline in Australia but I, I don't think there's one in, in the Pacific or maybe in Fiji and how can we basically work with this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can give twofold answers on this. Obviously, I mean, part of the discussion of internet governance is, I mean, how to extend, you know, and how to allow, you know, it's called reaching the next billion, how to allow, you know, <laughs> the other part of the world that doesn't have connectivity to get it. This is one part. And you address a specific question on IT activities, and I mean, uh, I'm representing the development sector this, this here. This is not the subject of this discussion. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm, so I'm just, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to address, and I'm trying to say something different. So, there are activities that are undertaken to to address this. The point is that. Uh, while we are trying to go toward a direction to allow connectivity, to try to facilitate, we have to inject I mean, uh, the, the, the security aspects on it, the cyber security, okay? Before it was seen something a little bit separated, but now every time that we had to try to address specifically specific issues on ICT connectivity, we had to take in consideration that cyber security is, I mean, an, is an, I mean an, I can say it's a fundamental part of it. And not just cybersecurity, but I mean all the issues related to how to facilitate these access to, to the youth, to the children, taking in consideration specific requirements of security of that, let's say, category of users that are accessing ICTs. So this is the only consideration that I wanted to give. It is okay. Thank you. Are there other 
Questions? Okay. I think uh, I think we can close this. So that, thank you very much, uh, all the panelists. I thank the director of the Standardization Bureau that helped us you know, in this uh, in this process. I, I thank you all of you. Thank you very. Much. In the always connected age, where we're going to talk specifically um, about mobile phones um, and the rising use of mobile phones by children and the challenges that poses. Um, we've had some confusion about how many people on our panel were actually here in Hyderabad. Um, finally, we have four people on the panel um, and I apologize to them for any confusion um, that's been caused. Um, but we're very glad they're all here. Unfortunately, um, our speaker from Vodafone uh, is not here, um, so we don't have the industry representative, but I think we will still be able to have a very interesting discussion. Um, firstly, I will just talk to you about ENACSO. We're hosting this workshop. It's the European NGO Alliance for Child Safety Online. Um, my name is Kathleen Spencer Chapman. I'm from the NSPCC, which is a child protection NGO in the UK, and we're one of the founding members of the European NGO Alliance, um, which has currently got 13 member organizations who are all um, NGOs specializing in uh, child protection, um, including working on online child protection issues. Um, from 13 EU member states. We are going to be building our network um, to include more NGOs um, from other countries as well. because we, we only started work officially in September. Um, Inaxo's role is um, what we're setting out to do together is by working together as um, child protection NGOs is to share our own learning and experience, our expertise of working with children and young people on online um, child protection issues, to actually then speak together with one voice in European discussions and global discussions about the internet um, and ensure that those concerns get taken on board, uh, which is of course why we're here at the Internet Governance Forum. Um, we're covering issues including online child sexual exploitation, child abuse images, internet governance and making sure child protection is taken into account there. And also child participation and making sure that what children themselves say about how they use the internet, how they use mobile phones and other technologies um, is really also recognised uh, in these discussions. So um, without further ado, we'll start uh, with the speakers. We have um, John Carr, who's working with Inaxo. Um, he's representing also the UK Children's Chari Charities Coalition on Inter Internet Safety um, and working closely with us. Um, I'll just briefly present who our other speakers are because there has been, have been some changes to the original programme. We have Margaret Moran, MP uh, from the UK. Uh, we have um, Adrian Dwyer, who's the network coordinator of InHope, and he will explain what InHope is later on. And Gita Stelt, who's an um, academic from Denmark, huh? specialising in um, uh, child protection and um, mobile phones. Okay, so we start with John. Right, well, good morning. Um, the internet goes mobile. New challenges in the always connected era. And uh, that's what I'm going to speak about for approximately 15 minutes. Um, and if I'm getting close to the end, if you just wave your hand and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start winding up. Um, Kathleen mentioned that I, I um, work with the children's organisations in the United Kingdom. Uh, there are um, eight of us all together that work together. Um, some of these organisations, such as the NSPCC and Bernardo's, are household names within the United Kingdom. It's uh, virtually everybody, every adult, 
will have he heard of um, NSPCC and also very, very high awareness of Bernardo's. And the fact that the children's organisations have been able to work together specifically around these internet issues has undoubtedly magnified and expanded our impacts because when, when they all come together like that, really governments have to listen, uh, the media has to listen, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've had some little success in this area in, in the United Kingdom, precisely because of the power of the children's organisations working together. Oops. And we've already heard about Inaxo, so I won't bother talking about, uh, about that again. Mobile phones and the internet. Well, the, the, I, don't know if, I don't know how many of you remember that advertisement there was for Martini. You know the drink, uh, Martini drink, and it was it, it was promoted in um, in cinemas and on the TV uh, as being any time, any place, anywhere. And that's the essential idea uh, that is now central to the way in which the internet is moving and the way that the internet industry is seeing, uh, seeing things moving. And it's coming under this uh, part of the, the wider issue of convergence, technological convergence. And now, for example, uh, within the United Kingdom at any rate, uh, and in the United States and various other countries, uh, you're seeing companies emerging now that offer you, they call it quad play. So you sign up with Virgin or you sign up with uh, O2 and you get not only your internet connectivity through broadband, you also get TV through cable or, through, or over ADSL over, uh, over that way. You get your landline and you get your mobile phone service together. And this is convergence happening in, uh, finally happening, the thing that everybody's been speaking about and predicting for years. And there are two main focuses for this, con uh, for this convergence, this technological convergence uh, taking place in the consumer market. One is inside the home. I've just mentioned how you buy essentially a package now with four services, TV, cable, uh, TV broadband, fixed line and mobile all together in a, in a single package. And Microsoft have, de have developed their, uh, and other companies have developed their media centres. So your television will be plugged into all of this and will become the hub of uh, a communications and entertainment network within your home. But I'm, I'm not going to particularly focus on. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the home uh, particularly because we're going to be talking mainly about mobiles. And in, in mobile, in the mobile space in particular, we're, we're beginning to see a huge expansion in the way in which mobile devices are being. Uh, developed. And one of the key elements that, that's uh, being integrated at this technological level, this convergence theme, is, is the Wi-Fi capabilities of mobile phone handsets. So not only, not only will your mobile phone do the common or garden things like make and receive phone calls, make and receive text messages, it's, they're also going to be internet enabled, they are already in many countries internet enabled devices which will allow you to connect to the internet either through your telephone company's own network or it, the, the access that it can provide directly or f using the Wi-Fi component um, uh, within the mobile phone handset essentially to log on to any available Wi-Fi connection. So uh, in that sense the mobile phone is also a generic uh, connected uh, device to the internet. And if we remember the, the history of how we came to be here today, here in Hyderabad, the WUSIS process, part of that was very much focused on a development agenda. And in one of the earlier sessions, somebody from Fiji, I think it was, mentioned um, specifically that in the uh, Asia-Pacific region, for example, there is still very little internet connectivity available in many, many countries. Now, it's very, very unlikely that these countries in the developing world, uh, such as Fiji, for example, are going to do what we did in the United Kingdom and that we did in Europe and dig great holes in the ground and put cables down and telephone wires down and run those cables and wires into individuals' homes. That's very, very unlikely to happen. What is very likely to happen, what is indeed happening, uh, and it's true here in India and uh, and, and in Africa as well, is that wireless, Wi-Fi enabled 
uh, telephones, mobile phones are going to be the main route, uh, not only for providing a telephone service, but also for, for, for providing um, internet connectivity, because it's, it's much, much cheaper and much, much quicker to set up WiMAX or other types of wireless, powerful wireless um, technologies um, than it is to dig up holes in the ground and, and lay in cables, which is what uh, historically we did. And mobile phones, they're, they're becoming, uh, as, as I've said earlier, much more than just a phone. Within, within some countries already, you can use your mobile phone to pay your bus fare, you can use it to buy low value items in shops. Uh, I don't know if those of you who've been, who've been to Hong Kong recently, uh, but they have the octopus system. Uh, in, in England we call it oyster cards. Uh, but basically you can, you can have your octopus card uh, integrated into your mobile phone or into your watch for that matter, into many different devices actually, but in, in particular into mobile phones. So your mobile phone becomes uh, a general kind of utility that you are always going to need and always going to want because you can, you, apart from anything else, you can pay your bus fare with it, you can buy a cup of coffee with it, you can get a newspaper with it on your, on your way to work that day and a range of other low value items, pay for tickets to go to the pictures. And as we also know, mobile phones uh, are becoming available with essentially small TV receivers built into them, so you'll be able to watch TV, either broadcast TV or IPTV, that's television provided over internet protocols. Social networking sites, very, very popular with young people. Uh, many of those have now developed specific applications that can be worked through mobile phone hand, handsets and they've they've made their websites WAP compatible so that they work through uh, and, and are tailored for the, the small screens that are available on, on the mobile device. So again, what we're seeing is a much greater utility and a much greater, a, a whole new set of reasons why if you didn't already have a mobile phone, you're going to get one and you're going to use it um, uh, uh, quite a lot. And the capacity and power of mobile devices is increasing at an astonishing rate. Take my own mobile phone as an example. Here I have a prop. <laughs> uh, I brought it with me. Uh, there it is, um, 246 megabytes internal memory, 4 gig uh, storage capacity in the bottom there, 400 megahertz processor, healthy amount of RAM, 3 megapixel stills and video camera, quad band so I can use it in any country in the world including Japan, quite you know reasonable download speeds, it's got Bluetooth, it's got Wi-Fi, it's got GPS uh, satellite technology built into it. Not that long ago this would have been a high-end computer that uh, business executives would have killed for sort of thing and you know made sure they were the first people in the firm to get them. Uh, but tomorrow this will be commonplace. In fact it's all, I've already, you know, somebody's already pointed out to me that I can't really brag about having a three megapixel stills or video camera in my device because the new sets of mobile phones are coming with 10 megapixel cameras and 10 megapixel videos uh, built in. Now that's important, uh, by the way, because the higher the quality of, of, of the image that you can take using your mobile phone camera, uh, or either as a stills camera or as a, vi or as a video, the greater its potential use in a whole range of issues to, which certainly occur in the child protection space. I mean, some of the videos that you see that go up on YouTube, for example, or get circulated in school playgrounds, they can be a little bit grainy and a little bit kind of often or historically have been a little bit hard actually to decipher. With the new uh, powerful cameras that are being built into the handsets, that's going to vanish. And not, it's, not that, uh, too, it's not too fanciful to imagine a time in the near future where you're going to have high-definition cameras built into into your mobile phone. So that's kind of broadcast quality TV uh, in your mobile phone device. And the key point, and perhaps an obvious point to make, is that from a child protection perspective in the mobile era, everything potentially gets, uh, gets harder. I mean, we thought, we thought in the UK, you know, we were getting, we were doing quite well, getting our educational programs uh, out to parents and into schools and into teachers, and they focused on uh, on the on, on 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 the old age when you know computers were the only way that you accessed the internet and the computer was a big box 
in a, in a library or in a classroom or in the home or whatever, and uh, theoretically at any rate a teacher, a librarian, a parent could be on hand to supervise or support the child's use of the computer. Well, of course, the whole point about a mobile device is that simply is no longer applicable. It's a personal device, it's a device you carry around with you, it's not a device that lends itself easily, uh, or as easily as computers did, or conventional computers did, uh, to uh, parental support, parental supervision, uh, or parental control. And that's why uh, we need to start thinking urgently about developing uh, educational programs which give a specific focus to what the mobile devices uh, can do. If Annie Mullins from Vodafone had made it here, one of her presentations which I've seen her give uh, in the United Kingdom, show, and she, she's got a, a video that, that does this, uh, she's speaking to parents about what they understand about their children's use of mobile phones. A very high proportion of parents, these are the people who bought the phones for their kids, had no idea, for example, that the phone would allow their children to connect to the internet. So, you're a good parent, you've got a computer at home, you've put filtering software on it, you've agreed a whole set of rules about how and when the computer can be used, what kind of things that can happen on it and that kind of thing, and then you discover you know, that for the past 12 months your child's had an internet-enabled mobile phone and there's been no discussion about that at all and you've no real idea about what's going on. So there's quite a big job to be done, just at a very basic level, in uh, getting across to parents exactly what these new mobile devices can do. And um, we recently did a survey in the United Kingdom, or in fact Ofcom, the statutory telecoms regulator, did of how mobile phone companies get out their general safety messages and while some of them did quite well, overall it wasn't really satisfactory. Um, they did a mystery shopping exercise going into some of the mobile phone shops, asking a series of questions about safety um, and mobile phones to the people selling the mobile phones and they get all kinds of crazy answers ranging. I mean, there were, there were some people in some of the mobile phone company shops who knew everything, got it all right, got, gave the right information to parents about mobile phone safety uh, and that kind of thing, but I'm afraid that was not true in the majority of cases. And in some instances, the sales assistants in the mobile phone shops got it completely wrong uh, and gave completely wrong information uh, about safety. So I, I've, I've already made this point about the uh, uh, reaching out to parents, teachers and so on is is very challenging and uh, and will be difficult to do, but it's in important work. Natasha Jackson, who was also going to be here from the GSMA, this is the global body that um, represents the mobile phone industry. She would have told you, I'm sure, about the great work that they're doing. Uh, within the European Union, and the, I think the EU deserves a great deal of, uh, of, of credit for this, they brought together all of the mobile phone companies, all of the big mobile phone companies in Europe, and got them to sign up to a code of practice on content and services being provided to children and young people. Um, and in that, in that document, it refers to the importance of mobile phone companies, for example, filtering and blocking out illegal child pornography websites so that you can't access child pornography websites through the mobile phone device. Every, comp every mobile phone company in Britain already does this. By, sign by, that, uh, by signing up to the uh, EU, the Commission's uh, document, every mobile phone company in Europe is undertaking to do something uh, similar. Um, every mobile phone company in Britain provides a filtering package uh, as part of its standard service. That when you, so when you buy a mobile phone, you will, not, you will also get a filtering service that will block out adult content, adult sites on the internet through the phone. In three out of the five cases it's on by default. In two out of the five cases if you want the filtering to work you need to ask for it to be turned on. But those two companies I think are going to move to a default situation in the, in the not too distant future. So there is a great deal of good work being done uh, by, the, by the mobile phone industry. Uh, in part encouraged by the Commission's vigorous intervention in, in setting up that um, mobile phone code, which I think comes up for its second anniversary in February of next year, or is it the first anniversary? I can't remember. Time flies as you get older. Um, 
the one element that's missing, the one element that's missing from this whole debate so far, are the, are the manufacturers of the mobile phone devices. Uh, you know, the Nokias, the Sony Ericsons, the Samsungs of this world. And they just don't come to the table. I mean, w I've only ever been in one meeting. In all of the work that I've done around these issues, I've only actually sat in the room once with representatives of the actual handset manufacturers present. And they were very kind of middle to low level management within the companies. And, and by the way, they were really nice guys and they, you know, they got it. Uh, they understood the importance of, of getting engaged with the child safety space in the mobile uh, area. But they simply weren't senior enough within their companies. And we, we tried to get Nokia and I got a kind of half promise from Nokia that they would come today. But in the end, I'm afraid, as they've done in the past, they simply haven't shown up. And that's really not, not good enough because with, when, we, when we went to see uh, the mobile phone companies in Britain first to talk about the child safety issues, we said, look, you need to build more and more protective stuff into the handset itself because you know, these are really mini computers now. So you, you need to be thinking about what's going to be in the device, hardwired into the device. And they said, well, there's nothing we can do about that because it's all determined by the handset manufacturers. In that one meeting we had with the handset manufacturers, I said, well, look, the mobile phone companies say it's all down to you guys, the handset manufacturers. And they said, oh, no, 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 it's not down to us. We only do what the mobile phone company networks ask us to do. So, you know, both sides were basically saying it wasn't their responsibility uh, in that respect, it was the other guy's responsibility. The truth is everybody's got a responsibility, particularly now, uh, I think, because the mobile phone handset manufacturers themselves are becoming content providers. They're moving further down the value chain. They've seen iTunes, they've seen... Uh, uh, the social networking sites beginning to make more and more money uh, from uh, essentially the provision of services or provision of content to the mobile device. The handset manufacturers want a bit of it as well. I don't, I don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, somebody's got to make capitalism work. The banks obviously can't. Let's hope the individual companies can. But if they are going to get involved in, in a, further down in the value ch chain, or even if they're not, it seems to me quite clear that the handset manufacturers have to step up and do more and get more involved in this whole space. One of the reasons I say that is that even, I mentioned earlier that the five mobile phone companies in, two minutes, the, the, the five mobile phone companies in Britain all provide a filtered service on the handset, uh, through, through, the, through the handset, but it's done at network level. If you've got Wi-Fi enabled, if you've got a Wi-Fi enabled telephone, and most of the new uh, mobile phone handsets are, then you know a kid can log on to a network using the Wi-Fi element, and the filtering simply becomes redundant because you're you're then getting your internet access through uh, through through the Wi-Fi network. It's nothing whatsoever to do with the mobile phone company anymore, and it's very easy for you know to to bypass so all of the good work that the mobile phone companies have done in putting this software on simply becomes reduced to naught. So that's why we say, or that's why I say in particular, um, that we need to get something onto the handset. So even if somebody can log in through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or you know whatever other connectivity, infrared, whatever other connectivity that the device might have built in, um, there'll be some sort of control and safety on the handset itself. That requires the handset manufacturers to cooperate. That's, that's the point I've, I've been making. <clears throat> it's also going to raise the issue of what happens in the cloud. You know the fashionable way now to speak about the internet and internet services is as, uh, as a cloud, cloud computing and so on. So more and more services are being provided from the internet itself. The idea is uh, you know, you'll have less and fewer and fewer applications on your device or on your computer and more and more of it will be provided in the cloud. Well, that's I, I don't have a problem with that, that's the way things are going. But what it does mean, I think, is that we're going to need more to be done at that network level to, to help uh, keep kids safe online. Very quickly and very finally, um, the other aspect of mobile phone devices, of course, is their capability to act as a as a tracking device. Every time you log, every time you turn your phone on, it goes and looks for your network. Uh, when it locates you, uh, when you locate, when it locates the network, the network knows geographically where you are, 
um, depending on the, if you're in a big city for example, where they've got lots and lots of cells working, they can know where you are to within 10 metres, 20 metres. If you've got GPS capability built into the phone, as I said, this has and most of the new phones are going to have, they can know where you are to within one metre. So there, there are surveillance issues, there are safety issues, um, uh, which arise in the context of, the, of these new devices as well. Uh, we have a code of practice governing uh, aspects of this in the UK, but it's not complete because we didn't. We entered into that agreement, that code of practice, uh, with the mobile phone companies before satellite technology became integrated into the handsets. It doesn't cover GPS-based services, therefore, and it, and it needs to. Uh, I mean, this is the question of the surveillance capabilities of mobile devices is a general one for civil society. It raises issues about privacy, it raises issues about spying, because these phones can also work as bugs, uh, but it also particularly raises issues in, in relation to child safety, because some of these tracking services can enable people to track individual handsets, individual children, in other words, and where that occurs, then of course we as child protection agencies have to be very vigilant. The end. Thank you very much. <laughs>